so we finished up with the anatomy yesterday, respiratory anatomy. You should be comfortable with sort of following how air gets in our body, it goes through our nose, what it's doing there, what are the features, where is it going next, the pharynx, what are the regions, larynx, what's the um, features of the larynx, you have the epiglottis, what is the glottis, you have the thyroid cartilage, the cricoid cartilage, the retinoids, the corniculates, the cuneiforms, then you go into the larynx or the trachea, and then the bronchioles, and then you have the divisions of the bronchioles, and then you go into the alveoli, and where the cells, you have the surfactant, and the role of surfactant, and that. And then we did spirometry, and you know the volumes, and you show the graph. So then today we're going to talk about actually getting oxygen loaded onto our red blood cells, unloading at the tissues, and these relationships then. I wanted to point out that there are specific laws, there's just four, that actually quantify what's going on with regard to each of the elements that we're talking about. For instance, Boyle's law was prominent, was something that we talked about prominently on Monday. Boyle's law, although we didn't name it, it is the principle. We talked about the diaphragm contracting and dropping down our external intercostals, expanding our chest wall. That increased the volume of our thoracic cavity. When our volume increases, that meant our pressure decreased. That's what it means by volume and pressure are inversely related. When one gets bigger, the other one gets smaller. So if we increase the size of our thoracic cavity, we decrease the pressure inside. That created the suction where air would come in. And so just that is quantified by a, a law and you can actually numerically determine the pressures and the molecules of air moving on in and out, so on. Um, there's Henry's law, Graham's law, they all are basic chemistry principles with regards to diffusion and getting oxygen in. One of the things that I definitely want you to consider and to know is that Dalton's law, it says our atmospheric pressure, so P ATM or P atmospheric, that's the pressure just outside that we breathe. So if you have a weatherman saying we're gonna have a high pressure front coming in, then you know that's what he's referring to, atmospheric pressure. In the air, the atmospheric pressure is made up of nitrogen, oxygen, carbon dioxide, and water vapor. Oxygen makes up about 20%, specifically 21%. So whatever the partial pressure of atmospheric air is, multiply it by 0.21, and that's what you have as far as the partial pressure for oxygen. So schematically, it looks like this. You have just air, 78% of air, the vast majority is inert, it's nitrogen. But the blue there, it shows you how much of what we breathe in is actually made of oxygen. What this means is at sea level, like in San Diego, uh, for instance, that is, tends to be the gold standard. It's considered to be one ATM or 760 millimeters of mercury. As you go up in elevation, so this y-axis shows us going up in elevation, although the atmospheric pressure numerically is decreasing. So here in Prescott, it's 630 millimeters of mercury. Then if you go up to Leadville, Colorado, you're up there at 534 millimeters of mercury. You get to Mount Everest, the top you're about 253 millimeters of mercury. This is based on data from John West, I think. So this is what the atmospheric pressure is. And so then we know based on this atmospheric pressure is the weather pressure. This is indeed what um, is out there and surrounding our atmosphere. We just have less and less pressure as we go up. So the air doesn't get thinner as much as it just has less pressure. Oxygen is still 21%. So 21% of a smaller number is less oxygen molecules. So that's why we have less oxygen available as we go up in elevation. Who can tell me why there are more successful ascents to the top of Everest without supplemental oxygen during good weather? Besides, it's just easier to climb when it's good weather and not a storm. So the effect of altitude on oxygen is at sea level, so we have this little graph here, showing at sea level, 760 millimeters of mercury. That's kind of the standard that we go with. Oxygen, if you do roughly 21%, you're looking at 160 millimeters of mercury, rounded. Here in Prescott, 
Because we start off with just 630 millimeters of mercury out in the atmosphere, our oxygen content is 132 millimeters of mercury. That means we have a lot less oxygen available than you would if you were at sea level. In fact, if you go up to Everest, this is actually how much you have, 53 millimeters of mercury. That's what's out in the air. So this is at sea level. So I'm gonna walk you through what is in the air. So this is where we were, 760 millimeters of mercury at sea level, approximately 21% is approximately 160 millimeters of mercury of available oxygen out in the air. You breathe that in, comes in your mouth, and then now, what do we do when it gets in the nasal cavity? We clean it, we warm it, and we humidify, humidify it. So now, the oxygen content is actually proportionally less now that we've increased the water vapor content. So now we're down to 149. Then we get down into the alveoli themselves and we're down all the way to 104. That's because the new air is mixing with the old air and the carbon dioxide that our body is continuously contributing to this level. So what is actually available at the level of our alveoli is 104 millimeters of mercury. So I wanted you to see that not only is it we have the 21% outside, but we actually reduce that amount based on our humidifying it as well as mixing with our old air and our new air. So this is what is going to be kind of our peak amount that is even available to give to our blood. So this is how we may want to look at this graph instead. So at sea level, we knew it was at 760 millimeters of mercury. Prescott, Leadville, Mount Everest, this is the atmospheric pressures. There's a line through it because maybe we want to look at it of what's the available oxygen partial pressure, 160 at sea level, you drop down to 132 at Prescott, and then it goes and reduces as you go up in altitude. So this is why as you increase in altitude, you have less atmospheric pressure, therefore you have less available oxygen. So now we get into the point where we have our 104 millimeters of mercury that's actually going to be down in our alveoli. So we figured out this is at sea level, we have the 160 outside, breathe it in, mixes with water vapor, mixes with our old air, carbon dioxide. Finally get down to the alveoli and the available partial pressure of oxygen is 104 millimeters of mercury. So these are the four factors that I want you to know that's going to affect how the oxygen inside of this alveolus is going to get out into the blood that's coming around it. So first and foremost is just the partial pressure difference. So if we have a red blood cell that has about 40 millimeters of mercury, let's say after that's sort of the used up blood coming in the pulmonary artery, coming back to our lungs so it can get reoxygenated, its level is about 40 millimeters of mercury that makes its way over to the alveolus. And what this is, the 104 of the air that we breathed in and the 40 is that we have left over on our red blood cell after we used up whatever we needed, this is our partial pressure difference. So obviously it's gonna go from high pressure to low pressure. Even though we talked about in the blood pressure as actual pressure like blood pressure, the amount of molecules on one side of the membrane to the other also constitutes a pressure gradient, which is why it's in millimeters of mercury. So the partial pressure difference, obviously if you just have that by itself, is driving oxygen out of the alveolus and onto the blood. The blood loads up, and I have it that it loads up here. So now we have the loaded up red blood cell at 100 millimeters of mercury not quite 104, and this explanation will come when we talk about the ventilation perfusion ratio, but we get right up, almost. We don't get completely saturated, but almost, in some parts of the lungs that we, we do. From the entirety of the lungs, we don't ever fully match exactly what's in the alveolus. So the partial pressure difference, so we came in at 40, just the gradient loaded it up, so it pretty much almost matched, some places will match perfectly, and now the red blood cell can head out, go back to the left side of the heart. Now it's gonna be ejected through the whole body. So how this partial pressure difference is, as you see, here's the 104 millimeter mercury 
We've got oxygen molecules and this membrane represents the membrane between the alveolus and the blood. So if we have a red blood cell coming back at 40, clearly there's gonna be less oxygen in the blood side compared to the alveolus side. So it comes over and then this is the direction, obviously a partial pressure gradient. So that's really just the base level what a partial pressure difference means. How would we negatively affect this? What would be something that would impair this or cause this to be reduced in any way? It would be high altitude. So at high altitude, if you just go up, instead of say having 104, by going up to altitude, you might have only 60 available in here. So now you're gonna have less of a partial pressure gradient pushing oxygen out onto the blood. So that's gonna be one way that you actually make this more difficult for your body. The thickness of membranes. So we have the membrane thickness between the air and the blood. Would you want a really nice, big, thick membrane or do you want a nice, thin membrane to, I, to cause the maximal diffusion? Thin. So this is one of those cases where more is not better. So here we want the thickness of the membrane is going to be a factor of how effectively we get oxygen to, un, to get out of the alveolus and into the blood. So if we have a normal pressure, partial pressure gradient, this is the direction it's gonna go, and here's our membrane. But what if we have a thickened membrane? Reasons for a thickened membrane could be pulmonary edema, pneumonia, any of these things that cause inflammation or increased fluid within the lungs is gonna now make it more difficult and a longer distance for the oxygen to go from the high concentration to low. So we still have our partial pressure difference. We're just now impeding it by the thickness of the membrane. So that's another factor of lungs that's going to affect gas exchange. Surface area means the interface between the air and the blood. So we want to have lots and lots of these little alveolar rooms. Each little alveolus is going to be its own little pocket of air, and each one is going to have its own little layer of blood around it so we can match it. So the surface area having multiple interface locations is going to maximize the ability for us to get oxygen into our blood. So here we have lots and lots of little tiny little surface area, little alveoli here. However, smoking is one way that would cause damage to these alveoli that would cause them to become damaged in that they would rupture and so we would end up with larger open pockets. So instead of lots of little individual rooms, some of the walls have fallen down, and so now that we have these larger, bigger rooms. So blood is really having to go way around out here and try to interface with that. So you've reduced your surface area, so you're less effective at getting oxygen loaded onto the blood. A cross section of a lung, if you recall in an image we saw last class period where we had the honeycomb image of all the little alveoli, so in there, that's what this is. It's a drawing of all the little alveolar spaces, some of the terminal bronchioles coming through. So the effect of smoking on an image like this would be like that, where you can see a drastic reduction in surface area. But now you've reduced all these extra little membrane walls where gas exchange can take place. The ventilation perfusion ratio, this last one is really just about gravity and distribution. So this one is where we want to consider the distribution of blood and the distribution of air. So that's what this means. Ventilation means air. Perfusion, it refers to the blood. So we want them to match up. We don't want to have some areas of the lungs where we have lots of blood and maybe not very much air. And that's not very efficient if we have areas of our lungs where we have lots of air and very little blood to go there. So that's what the ventilation perfusion ratio is. Where would blood, would blood be evenly distributed throughout the lungs or do you think blood's gonna hang out in one area? Yeah, blood's gonna fall down to the bottom a lot more significantly. It arrives, you know, here midway in the middle portion, but by gravity, a lot of blood is gonna fall towards the lower portion of the lungs. Then we have a little bit of blood in the middle and not very much at the top. 
Air, however, is on the opposite. We've got lots of air at the top, lots of space for air, and then kind of in the middle, sort of matches where the blood is, and then at the bottom, because there's so much blood, it kind of encroaches in on the alveoli a little bit, so that we're gonna have actually a little bit less air. So you can see where the, there's gonna be some ventilation perfusion mismatching. These regions that we just referred to in the lung are called zones. They were developed by John West at UCSD, San Diego. So zone one is the top of the lung. The, this is a representation of letting you know that the, par, the pressure, alveolar pressure, that means the air, is gonna be a lot higher than the capillary pressure, that means the blood. So you're gonna have more air, less blood. Zone two, it kind of balances out. Because of the intermittent flood, blood flow, because the beating of the heart, so we have these surges, so we might have a higher pressure and it goes lower. So you have intermittent, but it really is the Goldilocks region where it's kind of the perfect match. So they're pretty well matched in the zone two. Zone three, we can see we have way more blood or ca blood capillary pressure compared to alveolar. In essence, we have zone one is gonna be lots of air and a little bit of blood. Zone three at the bottom, a lot of blood and not as much air. Therefore, collectively coming from the lungs as a whole, we're never gonna get 100% oxygenation. So we're always gonna be just slightly under, which is why when I did the representation of the partial pressure of the alveolus, which was 104 millimeters of mercury, and then how the red blood cell came in at 40 millimeters of mercury and filled up to 100. It doesn't fill up to 104, maybe in zone one it would, but collectively from the lungs, because of the ventilation perfusion mismatch, particularly in zone three, we're never going to get it to match perfectly. We're still always going to be off a little bit. That's why when you do your O2 sats on patients, you're never going to get fully 100%. It's always going to be, you know, 97%. 98 is going to be really, really good, but won't be really. This is the picture from John West from one of his textbooks. John West is probably, right, is probably the most proliferative of all respiratory physiologists ever. We had a lot of development in cardiovascular and respiratory physiology right at the turn of the century. Um, respiratory physiology, the understanding of how it works, just skyrocketed from the point of just starting airplanes and air, um, air flight at the end of World War I, and then clearly the advances gone into towards World War II and then into space. That was, and then going up, then you had Sir Edmund Hillary climb to the top of Everest, and then you had Reinhold Messner and Peter Habler climb to the top of Everest without oxygen. So all of those events contributed significantly to our understanding of respiratory physiology, and John West at UCSD was at the forefront of it. So we're sort of, he's sort of like living history at this point. He's a legend in the physiology world. So I wanted to bring this back to the four main factors of just getting gas exchange to take place. We need a pressure gradient. So we need an area of high partial pressure of oxygen to drive it out to an area of lower, which would be onto the blood. Likewise, if we're talking about carbon dioxide, it's just gonna go the other way. We're gonna have a lot of carbon dioxide in the blood and less in the alveolus, so it's gonna actually direct it that way. So the pressure gradient will tell us not only which direction that the molecules are gonna travel from high down to low, but the amount of the gradient, the more that you can put on the high side, the greater the driving forces, obviously you're gonna push it. So that's where high altitude, we're still gonna go from the alveolus with oxygen out to the blood, the driving force is gonna be a little bit less because we just don't have as many molecules pushing its way up. Membrane thickness, we want it nice and thin, so conditions like pneumonia or pulmonary edema is gonna thicken the membrane or at least increase the distance from the alveolus to the blood itself. Then there's a surface area for gas exchange. The surface area for gas exchange is the interface. So things like emphysema, that's something that would disrupt that. So when patients are taking additional oxygen where they have a mask on or they'll nose things in, because they have issues of membrane thickness, maybe they have heart failure, Maybe they have emphysema, surface area issues. Whatever these two issues are, 
by putting oxygen, giving the patient oxygen, all you're doing is increasing the pressure gradient to try to overcome the failings of these other two factors. And then of course, there's ventilation perfusion mismatch um, that can happen. And chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, that covers a lot of them. That was the only one I could kind of come up with that would work in here. So I wanted to give you a sense of what was important in terms of basic factors, and then how that might be compromised in a clinical situation. So that is getting the air in. And then we want to figure out here is just all this slide is just giving you your ballpark numbers of what the partial pressures are. Alveoli are always denoted with a capital A. Arteries are always a lower case A and veins are always a lower case V. The nomenclature with the P means partial pressure of oxygen in the alveoli. It, this at sea level would be 104 millimeters of mercury. Because of ventilation perfusion mismatch, our arterial, systemic arterial oxygen saturation is going to be about 100 millimeters of mercury. This is not 100%. This is just 100 millimeters of mercury. And then we're going to use up anywhere from 60 to 80 millimeters of mercury, depending on what we're doing. And that's what's going to be coming back to the lung. The primary way that oxygen is transported in the body, we've already done this in the last unit, is on hemoglobin. That's the whole point. That's the reason why we have red blood cells, why it's packed with hemoglobin, because we can gather up and bind and transport so much more oxygen than if it was just dissolved. We only get, in what's transporting in our body, 3% of the oxygen is gonna be just plain old dissolved in plasma. So the fact that we have red blood cells with hemoglobin packed in, we have more binding sites, so we are able to transport much, much more oxygen than we otherwise would. This oxygen hemoglobin disassociation curve is a standard for what is taught with regard to the relationship between hemoglobin binding to oxygen. This curve, this is the gold standard curve, was made in 1966. The oxyhemoglobin disassociation curve is a relationship between our partial pressure of oxygen, this is in millimeters of mercury. So if we're here in the artery here at 100 or whether we're down in the veins here at 40, this is what we're measuring, actual amount of oxygen. This, SO2, means saturation. So this is how much is bound as a percentage on our red blood cells, on our hemoglobin. You would expect when they first, in 1966, were looking at a series of blood samples, you would expect that you have a little test tube of blood, and as you increase, going this way, increase the content, the atmospheric oxygen that the blood is exposed to, you'd, increase, you'd expect hemoglobin to bind more. It was expected that it would be a linear relationship. However, what was unusual and made, sort of put this on the map, was this odd, sigmoid curve. What it's saying is as you increase oxygen levels, the percent that's bound to hemoglobin isn't a one-to-one -one relationship, but we have a steep curve in that through a very narrow increase in oxygen range, we bind to more avidly onto the hemoglobin. So here we have our partial pressure of oxygen on our veins at about 40. And that's about here on the graph, which translates to being roughly 75%. All right, so it's 75% loaded. After we, in the lungs, load up our red blood cells, fill them all up, they're gonna be 100 by the time we leave back to the heart, now distribute that throughout the body. So the arterial, systemic arterial oxygen is gonna be at 100. All right, so that's up here. So we're looking at about 97%. Okay, so we look at how much we barely changed, well, not barely, but we didn't change the saturation very much for this huge difference here. Okay, so it's a pretty shallow curve there. So again, what the saturation is, the percent of binding on hemoglobin that's occupied by oxygen. So this is how avidly you want to think of it, how much hemoglobin is hanging on to oxygen. At the level of the lungs, at the 97%, this is our oxygen and hemoglobin binding in the lungs. You know, we're here at 104 millimeters of mercury. 
we're up there, get about 97% saturated in terms of our hemoglobin. This is what's leaving the lungs. This is what we're going to send out to the body. Okay, we get down into the tissues. And after we've unloaded at the level of the tissues, because there's a concentration gradient from the blood to the cells. So if the blood, you know, we load it up at 100 millimeters of mercury, that's the arterial little blood. We get to the cells, we unload some of that oxygen because of the partial pressure gradient, where it's high concentration in the blood, lower in the cell itself. So it's sending it, so it's unloading. So this is the oxyhemoglobin after unbinding at the cells. This is just based on only the concentration gradient. All right, so we unload it, great. And that puts us about 75% bound. So we still have 75% more oxygen left on our hemoglobin at this point. We unloaded, you know, just a little bit, the amount just based on the concentration gradient. So this is where things get shifty. The curve shifts. All of a sudden, we have a shift. This is known as a rightward shift. You can see how the relationship shifted right. And this is the nomenclature that you're going to get when you get ref refer to the oxyhemoglobin disassociation curve. At this point, what happens is at the level of the muscles or the tissues, any place that you're using oxygen, we use oxygen to make energy. That's in the mitochondria. Anytime you are making ATP, you're making energy, heat is a byproduct. It's just like having your car on and the engine running, it's just idling, your hood's gonna get warm. So the presence of heat change the relationship of the oxygen to the saturation such that the curve turns right. That's science, scientific terms. Clinical terms just means increasing temperature, we now have unloaded. So instead of being at 75% saturated, we can see we've moved over to 67 or 65% or something. We unloaded more to the tissues. And then, we can shift it further over. Just the presence of acidity, so decreasing pH or increasing H plus are allowing even more oxygen to come off and therefore our saturations here. So at the level of the tissues, the nomenclature is a rightward shift of oxyhemoglobin disassociation curve. All that means is this is the normal relationship with hemoglobin based on just the concentration. You throw heat in, you unload extra. You throw a little acidity in, you even unload extra. So it's not a static curve. In the lungs, we have a condition where we're loading up our hemoglobin, but we don't wanna hang on to hemoglobin so tightly. So let's get to the tissues and the environment of the tissue helps us unload even more than we otherwise would have. So really the whole point of this is, what are the conditions that's gonna help oxygen and hemoglobin load up? And then what are the conditions that's gonna help it unload? And that's really it. So it's temperature and acidity. That's really the bottom line. There's a couple other elements. So this is my summary for it. At the level of the lungs, this is what's going on. At the level of the tissues, this is what's going on. So let's walk through the tissues one. How is that gonna be different? It's gonna be hotter, compared to the lungs, and it's gonna be more acidic. Okay, both of those conditions help to unload oxygen, detach it, disassociate oxygen and hemoglobin. So on this side, we'll go through the tissue side. Blood, from the blood into the tissues, we're gonna facilitate unbinding of oxygen and hemoglobin. That's sort of letting the oxygen off of the red blood cell bus. Higher temperature, so it's gonna be warmer. That's going to help the unloading. Just the presence of carbon dioxide, because it is at the level of the cells that carbon dioxide is being produced. So let me draw this a cell here. That's a cell with a mitochondria in it. We do capillary here. So we have the capillary, we've got oxygen on our red blood cells, a little oxygen molecule that's packed in there. As it goes through, obviously oxygen is going to come inside and we use oxygen in the mitochondria. We have our more red blood cells. 
and not all of the oxygen leaves. We still have some left over. In the mitochondria is where we make carbon dioxide. The carbon dioxide that's produced in the mitochondria in the cell obviously is going to leave and comes out into the plasma. Just the presence of carbon dioxide in the plasma here will actually help even more oxygen unload. So how cool is that? If our cell is using more oxygen, because it's actually maybe generating more ATP, not only does it need more oxygen, but it will produce more carbon dioxide. So you can see that it helps to serve itself. The more active that cell is, the more it's going to extract off of the red blood cell. So that's what this one is. That's called the Haldane effect. The other important one is decreasing pH. The blood becomes more acidic by carbon dioxide. Now we're gonna get into some chemistry. So if we have carbon dioxide that's made in the mitochondria at the Krebs cycle in the tissues, it diffuses out of the cell and it combines with water in the plasma. It then becomes carbonic acid. Carbonic acid is an acid because it disassociates so it's going to disassociate to H plus and HCO3 minus. This is known as bicarbonate. This is so we have carbon dioxide produced by the Krebs cycle in the mitochondria in the cell diffuses out first by the Haldane effect, helps to unload even more oxygen to help our cell out. Carbon dioxide then converts or combines with the water in the plasma to become carbonic acid. The basic easiest definition of an acid is any molecule that some part of will dissociate into an H plus ion. So the fact that it just part of it, even a small, small percent, wants to become this proton, this H plus ion, by definition makes it an acid. Basic chemistry principles, if you have a very strong acid, like hydrochloric acid, it's got an H and a Cl. Pretty much 99% of that stuff is gonna be disassociated. They're gonna be separate. A weak acid, like carbonic acid, not very much. Most of it's gonna stay as carbonic acid, but there's a percent that's gonna disassociate. So that's why it's actually called an acid. When you're in your biology class or chemistry class and you're looking at a solution and you're trying to measure the pH of it, and you have that little tape, the litmus paper that you go in there. What the litmus paper is detecting in the solution is the concentration of these. There's either a lot of H pluses and it's really acidic, or there's not very many, and it's not, or it's less acidic. Based on this concept, the CO2 directly unloads oxygen. CO2 directly unloads oxygen from the red blood cell. The CO2 so it further disassociates into this. This also helps the red blood cell unload even more oxygen. So carbon dioxide is kind of a double whammy. So that's where just decreased pH acidity, mostly coming from carbon dioxide, but what if our cell here is really working. It's a muscle cell and it's working extremely hard and it actually starts to produce lactic acid. That's also going to come out here. Our pH is going to drop. That's going to go tell our red blood cell we need even more. So essentially what this summary slide tells us 
is to help unbind oxygen bound to hemoglobin, to help unbind it, not only is just there the basic concentration gradient, you just show up and there's a lot in the blood and not very much in the cell. All right, so I'm gonna unload based on that. It's a warm environment. We're gonna get some more unloaded. Now it's, we've got carbon dioxide. That'll unload a little extra. And now the carbon dioxide is converting into an acid or we have some H pluses around, that helps unload it. And then if we're really working hard and we make lactic acid, that even further helps us to extract even more oxygen off of our red blood cells. And likewise, cooler temperatures or an alkaline environment is gonna facilitate oxyhemoglobin binding. Fetal hemoglobin binds more avidly to oxygen because the fetus is trying to extract extra oxygen off of mom, right? So if fetus is trying to extract extra oxygen, it has special hemoglobin that's a more powerful oxygen magnet. So you would describe fetal hemoglobin as having a higher affinity for oxygen than normal hemoglobin. You good with that? So now I'm gonna go back again and talk about myoglobin. Who can tell me what myoglobin is? We did it in 201. Muscles, excellent. Which muscles? Heart, which skeletal muscles? And heart, for sure, is our muscle that has the most myoglobin in it. Slow twitch muscles. So if you, so for instance, Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving dinner, you've got dark meat on the turkey and light meat. Myoglobin is in the dark meat. It rhymes with hemoglobin, so it actually has oxygen binding. So we have more myoglobin in the dark meat, and that's what gives it its dark club. It's a slow twitch muscle fibers. Think about what the turkey does all day. They're walking around. That's the turkey, walking around. So they have like little marathon runner legs. So that's where you see the dark meat in the thighs. Now a turkey, they're not much for flying, right? So they get up, this little fly thing, and really short there. So their pectoralis major muscles, the breast muscles, the white meat is the fast twitch muscle fibers. And so they don't have a long duration. They're gonna hypertrophy and they're gonna be very quick, but they don't have a long duration. So we don't really care about oxygen that much. It's not gonna be flying that long to be able to really utilize the oxygen extraction. So dark meat that is using oxygen on a regular basis, like in our heart, eating every day, every day um, all the time, marathon runner muscles, it's gonna have a lot of myoglobin in it. And you're gonna, really what myoglobin is, is inside the cell, I have these all, I'm gonna put a big M, myoglobin, what that does is it's like fetal hemoglobin in that it helps to extract even more oxygen off of the red blood cell so the cell gets even more oxygen in it, but just those slow twitch fibers. So that's why myoglobin is on this list for helping to further remove oxygen from red blood cells. The main way carbon dioxide transport is as carbonic acid here. So in this slide, I want you to notice that the majority of carbon dioxide is transported as carbonic acid. Some carbon dioxide, and I just have it rounded down to 20% on the next slide, some carbon dioxide likes to ride in red blood cells, but the majority of it is gonna be converted as carbonic acid. In this slide, here's the summary. So most of carbon dioxide is carbonic acid in the plasma, 20% roughly is gonna be on red blood cells and 10% is gonna be as carbon dioxide dissolved directly in the plasma. So I'm gonna ask you, there's gonna be two distinct test questions. What is the main mechanism for transporting oxygen in the blood? And your answer will be? Bound to hemoglobin in red blood cells. What is the main mechanism of carbon dioxide transport in the blood? As carbonic acid. Chemoreceptors, two main groups I want you to think of. Central, being in the brain, and peripheral, out in the body. 
in the brain, the chemoreceptors are located in the brain stem, the pons and the medulla oblongata. We have our respiratory and our cardiovascular centers distributed between these two regions. In the brain, because of the blood-brain barrier, the brain is more responsive and determines our breathing rate and depth of breathing and all the controls of our diaphragm and our breathing muscles by the presence, primarily by the presence of carbon dioxide and therefore pH. So we always want to relate carbon dioxide and H pluses. They're always going to be together. The more carbon dioxide we have, the more acidity we have, the more H pluses. That is a greater stimulus on our central chemoreceptors in our brain than oxygen. So conversely, our peripheral chemoreceptors, meaning out in the body, we have our aortic arch and we have our carotid sinus. So here in our aortic arch and carotid sinus, we also have chemoreceptors. They're sensing chemicals. They sense oxygen, carbon dioxide, pH. Peripheral chemoreceptors are more primarily affected by oxygen. So the brain is driven, our breathing is driven primarily by carbon dioxide, but it can be overridden by oxygen levels out in the periphery. In a normal case, a person's triggering mechanism to breathe is based on their carbon dioxide levels. So you imagine carbon dioxide levels rise, brain says we better start breathing so we can get rid of it. So we breathe, you can consider it in general as we breathe to get rid of carbon dioxide, as opposed to how we always think of it as getting oxygen. Of course we want oxygen. But the trigger is, oh, higher levels of carbon dioxide trick trip the mechanisms in our pons and medulla so we can breathe out. The fundamental basic thing you should know right now, central chemoreceptors are responsive to carbon dioxide and H pluses or acidity, and peripheral ones are more responsive to oxygen. To put it together, for instance, if you were gonna have a contest with your friend and you want to like, go to the pool and you'll have a contest, say who's gonna stay under the water the longest. So if you and your friend are standing there, and of course, before you jump in the water, you wanna take a big breath of air so you can have the most oxygen available. But what else do you wanna do? Because now that you know what triggers the brain to take the breath, what do you wanna do that's going to let you last longer before you need to take the breath? You wanna exhale, so you wanna get rid of extra carbon dioxide first. So what you would do, actually hyperventilation, where you do rapid shallow breaths, like panting like a dog, that is going to actually lower your carbon dioxide levels a little bit more. So you do this panting, drop off, drop your carbon dioxide levels, one big breath to bring in some oxygen, and now compared to your friend, your carbon dioxide levels are lower. So you're gonna be sitting there under the bottom of the pool, Holding your breath, holding your breath. Pretty soon, your friend's gonna be like, mm, can't make it, they go to the top, and you wait a little bit, and then you go to the top. So this actually works, you'll see it in the Olympics. You can see a lot of the swimmers, especially when they do a sprint and they don't wanna have to breathe, you know, and that messes up the hydrodynamics. They'll do some hyperventilation, hyperventilation before they take their big breath and jump in. Hypercapnia. Obviously, hyper means too much, and when you see caffeine, it means carbon dioxide. Hypo means a lower level of carbon dioxide. So you know that hypercapnia is going to be more associated with acidity. Hypocapnia is going to be associated more with an alkaline environment. Hypoxia, lower arterial oxygen levels. You get that when you go to altitude. So these guys here, hyper and hypoventilation. So I just mentioned hyper shallow rapid breaths is you're gonna lower your carbon dioxide levels. Hypoventilation is going to actually bring up your carbon dioxide because you're not breathing it out as much. So knowing these terms, you will want to then say, you know, understand that conditions of a person that is hyperventilating is going to have what? Higher lower 
or normal level of carbon dioxide in their blood if they're hyperventilating. Lower. They're gonna have lower, which is why sometimes they'll tell people when they're hyperventilating to breathe in a bag. Just bring some of your carbon dioxide back, you're too low. So carbon dioxide doesn't necessarily mean it's the devil, we wanna get rid of it, it's our waste product, but it's also a triggering mechanism for a brain. So sometimes people that are hyperventilating and they can't stop and they're in this cycle, breathe back in that carbon dioxide, get those levels to raise and they'll reheat into your brain. So that's where that is. So as a summary, we wanna think about factors of just getting oxygen or molecules in we want to have the partial pressure gradient. We want to have a thin membrane. We want to have as maximum surface area as possible to get the oxygen from the alveolus onto the blood. And then we want to match our air and our blood so that it, we have an ideal balance. We never are going to get that way in our, in our lungs. So we always like max out about 97% saturation. We never get fully 100%. Then when we load up in the lungs, it's a cooler environment, a little more alkaline because our carbon dioxide starting to unload. We get our red blood cell down to the level of our tissues and to our muscles and it's warmer. So now we have more oxygen that wants to unload. We have a gradient, so it's already driving it into the muscle cells. Carbon dioxide is produced there, that helps oxygen unload. Carbon dioxide turns into an acid, that helps it to unload and therefore we have more oxygen going to the cells. If you have slow twitch muscle fibers like a marathon runner or your heart, we have myoglobin that pulls off even more oxygen so that we can feed it into the mitochondria and make more ATP. Carbon dioxide, when it's made in the cells, comes out into the plasma. Not only did it help unload more oxygen from red blood cells, it then converted into carbonic acid and that's the form it prefers to travel back into the lungs. At the point it gets the lungs, it goes back to being carbon dioxide and water and you breathe it right back out. The presence of acidity and CO2 is a primary trigger for your brain for it to determine your breathing rate and depth. Your peripheral chemoreceptors are more responsive and can override the brain based on oxygen levels. So brain, CO2, periphery, O2, those are the primary drivers. And that's it.